Abney Park's toy shop at the end of the world. Chapter 7, The Ballerina. Things were now different after nightfall in the toy shop. Since they had befriended the toy maker, the little girls came up each night, and each night he greeted them. He would show them toys he had made, he would teach them how the toys worked, and as he did, he would play with them and tell them about the world. These are the trains that bring the food to the city from all over the world, Calvin said, turning a dial that made a set of ornate electric trains puff across a miniature diorama of the city, like the one they lived in. There was a tall wall surrounding the city, and nothing but gravel fields outside it. Where did they get the food? asked Isabella. Secret farms and ranches outside the city walls. But I thought there was nothing outside the walls but rocks and monsters. Did you? Calvin moved a diorama on a different cabinet. They do say that, don't they? Now, this is an aeroflat, said Calvin, switching to an eight-inch flying platform on which little mechanical men stood with rifles. Hunters stand on these platforms and shoot the beasts as they run around in the jungle. Oh, that's horrible, said Chloe, shooing a half a dozen small mechanical tigers into a cluster of tiny trees and out of range of the miniature hunters. Is it? said Calgory. Oh, well then. And he reached into another toy display and pulled what looked like a beautiful ornate pirate ship hanging from under a zeppelin. He placed it above the hovering model of the aeroflat. Then these will be the airship pirates, and they will attack the hunters. The rather large miniature airship swung around in mid-air to point its broadsides at the aeroflat. Its cannon shot out little streams of sparks towards the hunters on the platform, and as they did, Calvin made booming noises with his mouth as a small boy would. The airship pirates hate the hunters, Calvin said. Why? The hunters on the platform work for the city. The city tries to lock the pirates in the tower. Airship pirates want to leave free outside the city with the nomads and the sea gypsies, but it's against the law. Calvin, Chloe asked. Yes, Chloe. Is that for pretend? Is that just a pretend while playing with the toys? Or is there really a jungle outside the city and pirates and Indians and gypsies and animals? The toy maker turned to Chloe and Isabella. He thought a moment about how he should answer. Then he said... The schools would teach you that it is pretend. Your uncle would tell you it was a pretend. Maybe it is just a pretend. Maybe it's just a dream. And maybe if you chase your dreams, people will call you crazy. Many people have called me crazy about the many things they didn't believe in until I built those things. In the end, when I was right, they never saw what I did. They went on thinking my dreams wouldn't work long after I proved it to them. And they went on thinking I was crazy. But I was happy being right all the same. But he looked dark and distant, not happy. Chloe thought, He didn't answer my question. Maybe he didn't want to. Then a sparkle came into Calvin's eyes, as he seemed to remember something. Chloe, I made you something. Would you like to see it? It's very wonderful. Oh, please, said Chloe. It's in the workshop. Come with me, he said, and he walked briskly, like a little boy on Christmas morning. The inside of the workshop was dark, and Gyrod was standing on one side of the workbench, looking reverentially towards it. On the bench was a seated figure draped in a white sheet. Is it a toy ghost? Bella said, clearly excited about the prospect. No, it's better than that. But stay right there. She's not quite done, and I don't want to scare you or her. He quickly put on his leather apron. This will only take a minute. Calvin lifted something from the counter that looked like a lumpy, pearl-white dish with several holes in it. It was flexible in his hands as he carried it to the shop table. He slid down the sheet, but blocked what was underneath with his shoulders while he attached the dish. He then pulled the sheet back up, went around to the back of the figure. There was a ratcheting sound as Calvin wound the large toy, and when he stopped, Chloe could hear a soft whirring noise, almost like a purring. Then Calvin snapped a rear panel in place, and the noise was muted. At once, the figure moved under the sheet, straightening its posture and turning its head. It was alive. I... there is something wrong. I can't see. Said a small, timid female voice from under the sheet. Hello? Is anyone there? Bella stepped forward to the workbench. 
It's because you're under covers. Oh, I see. May I remove them? Asked the voice. Feel free, said Calvin, who was now on the far side of the shop, hanging a few small tools back in their place on the wall. Two delicate arms reached out from under the sheet and slowly pulled it down, revealing the face of a beautiful teenage girl. She had brown hair pulled back into a bun, large, moist eyes, and soft white skin. She held the sheet around herself at her shoulders, and she looked shy. Her skin and eyes were flawless. You would not have been able to tell her, from a real girl, if not for the few not-yet-concealed joints and gears around her elbows and neck. Calgory had intended to cover those, but he was concerned that she would look too real and would therefore be illegal. Out of fear of the social ramifications of sentient machines, the government had outlawed all but the simplest of automatons. This posed a problem for automatons because none were actually simple enough to adhere to the law, so they all hid their intelligence. Exposed gears helped them look primitive. I'm cold and scared. The sheet was quivering, as were her long, slender legs now protruding from under it. You're not cold. Your body is telling you that you're naked. Calvin came over and held out to her a small pile of pale blue silk. Put this on. The girl brushed the sheet aside with one arm, and she was indeed naked. Her face was full of shame and fear, and she glanced around the room nervously and abashedly. She had the body of a slender girl of seventeen, all ribs and nearly flat chest, and she crossed her arms across her chest to hide her small breasts. She took the garment from Calgory, and she stepped off the work table with a surprisingly graceful and intentional movement. She stepped up into it, pulled it up to her waist, and then pulled her arms through the shoulder straps. With the dress on, Chloe and Isabella jumped and clapped. A ballerina! They exclaimed as the girl was indeed wearing a leotard and a tutu. The ballerina stared questioningly at the girls. Calvin got down on one knee in front of Chloe. Weeks ago, you told me you wanted to be a ballerina when you grew up. So, I made you a ballet teacher. Chloe hugged him, a huge smile stretching across her face. At made you, the ballerina looked again at her arms and legs, which were perfectly formed and covered with goosebumps. Then she looked at Gyrod and tried not to look horrified when she looked back at the joints in her own arms. Calvin stood up and turned towards the ballerina. Your name is Timony. I am Dr. Calvin Calgory. This is Isabella and Chloe. You are to teach them ballet. Would you like to do that? Do I know ballet? Asked Timony, looking surprised. You do? Why don't you try a curtsy? She gazed blankly for just a second, as if trying to remember something, and a small clicking sound came from her chest. Then she curtsied slowly and gracefully, with a good deal more flourish than she expected. Timony was surprised, but her motions were polished and perfect. Chloe and Bella curtsied back, much less gracefully, but with huge smiles. She's the most beautiful ballerina I have ever seen, Isabella said. Then Timony looked worried. Doctor? Yes, Timony? I... I can't remember anything. Her eyes widened. She looked at him imploringly. I think there is something wrong. No, there is nothing wrong, Timony. You can't remember anything because you've just been born. Just this minute. There is nothing yet to remember. Timony looked horrified. She looked down at her legs and held out her arms and began to tremble. I know, it's confusing. Gyrod stepped forward now, and he stood over her. In his deep, scratchy voice, he said, I was scared too, Timony. At first... Timony looked up at the giant with wide eyes, and then back to Calgory imploringly. Please sit down, Timony. I'm afraid it's always a bit of a shock, but better that shock than never to have been born. He said this more to himself than to her, as if reassuring himself. Timony looked scared, and she sat down once again on the workbench. Then Calvin said, I'm afraid it's always worse the more intelligent you are. Try not to let it get to you. Much of what you know has been copied from elsewhere. This is how you can walk and talk and dance and think. 
You remember what a table is and what a door is, but I can't give you personal memories. That leads to all kinds of sadness. When I've done that in the past, the poor souls felt ripped from another life, one they had not actually lived. And they spent all their waking hours trying to get back to the loved ones they never knew. Poor Timony was crying now. Small silver tears ran down pearl-white soft cheeks. Deep inside her porcelain head, she thought it would be better to miss loved ones, to miss a mommy, than never to have had one. Calgory gave her a fatherly hug, and then he said, I think you'd feel better if you danced. When things feel strange, doing that which you were made to do will make them feel normal again. Timony looked up into his eyes, and he kissed her on the forehead. The old man walked to the corner of the room, shoulders slumped and tired. He placed an old lacquer disc on a very old-looking Victrola, then turned the crank. He pointed its beautiful brass horn towards the center of the room and placed the needle on the record. The machine began to play a crackling but beautiful waltz, and the two small girls bounced on their feet a bit to the music, barely able to contain themselves. They had not heard much music before in their silent apartment below the toy shop, so this was a wonderful treat. Timony, still looking scared and nervous, took three steps towards the center of the room. Without trying, the steps fell perfectly in time with the three-four rhythm of the waltz. There you are, said the old man. I'm afraid I only have a few records. I'll need to find you some Strauss or some Tchaikovsky, but this will have to do for now. Timony held her left arm low and curved, and her right arm higher, so that her hand was level with her head. She took two steps and a shuffle, once again her feet falling effortlessly in time to the music. Then she smiled, for the first time in her life. The doctor was right. This is what made her feel happy, and her smile made him smile. She turned to Chloe and waved her over with one hand. Timony placed one arm around the small of Chloe's back and held her other hand high, and with a nod that meant, now we'll begin, Timony waltzed Chloe around the room. Chloe beamed and grinned so wide you could see all of her teeth, her pigtails bouncing and swinging to the beat. They spun around the workshop. Timony looked content and perfectly at home, back arched gracefully, red lips slightly parted, eyes no longer moist but smiling. Little Isabella bounced on her toes, raising one hand and saying, Oh, my turn, my turn. So the good doctor walked across the floor, took her by both hands, and put her feet atop his. Then he waltzed her in smaller circles, clumsier than the elegant Timony, but all smiled and laughed as the scratchy Victrola squealed out its Viennese waltz. Now, children have a gift. You know this if you can remember it, though many lose the memory early on. Children can be happy in the hardest of circumstances. Their happiness is simply relative, since they don't have many experiences to tell them about the unfairness of their life. So, when you might say to yourself, it's not fair I don't have luxuries that others have, you might get horribly unhappy about it. But a small child will think, I'm so lucky to have found a rock shaped like a horse and play happily with it all day. Their joy is simply relative to the rest of their lives. So Chloe and Isabella had been happy many times before. But this dance was the deepest, most profound happiness they had yet felt. There was no fear, no worry, no foreboding in this. It seemed to them as though their life had taken a huge and permanent step towards a happier life. Which is why I am so sorry to tell you about what is to come. <laughs> <laughs> 